a, a, a double beat for her, so she's gonna perform the jingle dress. From uh, from what I know so far, that this style of dress was given uh, to the uh, to the Cree people, to the OG Cree, uh, through a dream. And that was to help uh, a princess through her dream, help her dad who was a chief. And through that dream, she was given the jingle dress and was to ask to dance the style of song. So I'll sing this song for you. You ready? Oh, my God. 
Hi everyone. Um, many of you. We're gonna have some um, one of our one of our uh, colleagues joining us on virtual. So we'll get we'll hear her on the on the microphone when we get started. Um, but yeah, hey everyone, my name is Gabrielle Fayant. Um, I'm originally from Alberta. My family comes from Fishing Lake Métis Settlement, um, but I currently live in unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Territory. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a guest really far away from my homelands, but uh, that's where we created A7G, which is a grassroots youth org. <laughs> and um, yeah, super grateful to be on Lenape territory. Um, and uh, being at the permanent forum has been been really wild and uh, a lot of good experience and yeah just great to meet other indigenous folks from around the world um so i guess before i get started i'll just share a little bit about our feathers um so this is um a feather that was gifted to us by cindy blackstock and um it was gifted to her in her homelands um while they were starting a lot of the uh a lot of the the court cases and tribunal work um that we're now seeing like that come to fruition and so uh yeah she gifted this to a7g she felt that it was time for it to move on to the next phase um and then this is uh eagle feather that was gifted to us um by some of our uh by some of the youth in Ottawa, um, and yeah, so we we I like to carry both of them and um, just like helps us out right now, especially with like all this colonial jargon and policies and legislation happening all around us. Um, and being so far away from home, it's good to have your uh, sacred items. But uh, enough about that. Why we're here today. Uh, we're really excited to launch our uh, report. Um, so it brings together 10 Indigenous youth groups from across uh, Canada. And um, I'm going to share like the, the, the sh like a really short summary. Um, it's not that long of a read if you want, if you do read it, but I'll just do like a really short summary of some of like the key points. So um, a really big part of this report um, that we want, the, and the reason why we wanted to come to the UN is because Canada simply isn't listening to the words of grassroots Indigenous youth. Um, and so this is like some, this is actually a quote by George Erasmus. So this is like from the RCAP report, which is over 20 years old. and. Um, He's literally saying the same thing that we're saying today. And, you know, we're really fed up with the lack of, of change. The, we're really fed up of just the words. And um, we, need to move, we need to move this work into action. Um, and then this was like a quote that was shared um, when we did the Indigenous Youth Voices report. And that was about five years ago. So a lot of this work comes from um, about in 2017, we created a roadmap on uh, the implementation of TRC Call to Action 66. Um, and these are some of the recommendations. They're real blurry. <laughs> but uh, Brittany, you want to read off the immediate next steps from that report? Uh, so number one, commitment from the government of Canada that will implement uh, truth reconciliation call to action number 66 with a whole of government approach and that the prime minister, as the minister of youth, will champion this by creating, uh, supporting the creation and the mandate of the Indigenous Youth Voices mission and vision. Um, second, legislate the government of Canada, uh, Indigenous Youth Voices Fund as stated in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission call to action 66. We call upon the federal government to establish multi-year funding for community-based youth organizations to deliver programs on reconciliation. 
followed by initial funding for IYV, and then as well, develop an operational and accessible online IYV network and platform. And finally, distribute interim funds for youth programming by the federal government through a process led by Indigenous Youth Voices, um, Indigenous Youth Voices Network to participate in selection committee and funding reviews. And then just so just so folks know what 66 really is, it's it did come from the <coughs> TRC call to act TRC commission. <coughs> Sorry. And then um, do you want to read it? So the two <laughs> truth reconciliation commission call to action number 66 reads, we call upon the federal government to establish multi-year funding for community based youth organizations to deliver programs on reconciliation and establish a national network to share information and best practices. So one of the things we found, <clears throat> so one of the things we found when we did the initial report is that the research that existed to articulate the realities of indigenous youth were either um, done really poorly or unethically. So this was one of the next steps we did is we created um, like an ethical research engagement. Um, so these are seven requirements that youth told us needed to happen um, prior to them providing information um, to the government pretty much or in any kind of report, regardless of who's doing it. And then, um, those uh, those ethical re requirements are what we use in all of our research and, re and reporting. <clears throat> oh, <there is>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so this is. Uh, can we make it less blurry? I'm like, is it me? Is it my eyes? Or is That's this fine. really blurry? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right now, um, TRC Call to Action is, is considered in progress. Um, there is an organization, Canadian Roots Exchange, some of you might be familiar with it, um, that did get f uh, about 16 million, I think it's up to $20 million over the last five years to do TRC 66. Um, however, uh, all of the, the information in our reports were changed, and then they didn't even reference our work. <laughs> so that's why it, it's really great that there's like these indigenous groups that are keeping track of how the federal government is, um, you know, doing, you know, taking care of reconciliation. So Indigenous Watchdog is like a group of, of Indigenous folks that are that are really like staying on the ball. And Yellowhead Institute is a really good resource as well to see where the calls to action really are. Um, they're very different when you look on the Canadian website compared to how Indigenous organizations like Indigenous Watchdog or the Yellowhead actually are viewing these, these calls to action. So, um, yeah, we'll go to the next one. Um, so we met with over about 10 Indigenous youth organizations and um, so they're all uh, they're all going to talk about their, well not all of them, but five of them are going to talk This isn't like in theory what could happen if Indigenous youth had funds to do certain things. These are actual youth groups doing the work without the, the necessary resources and capacity. And so that's who we're really advocating for. Um, and this is, a, this is like a few different ways we've explained some of the youth groups. Um, so a lot of them are like aunties and uncles and aunties that are, you know, taking care of young people um, when they don't have those other resources in place or other support circles in place. Um, it's, it's 
all it's it's so different from group to group but there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer community support um there's a, a lot of them are lifelines or considered like life-saving work um and so that's what we heard and then uh some of them are doing like land-based work teaching young people how to hunt and fish and um, harvest on the land, all these things that were stolen from us through the residential school policy. Um, and then, uh, of course, like food sovereignty is a big one and land protection and land revitalize or language revitalization are all part of the work that those youth groups are, are doing in the area. So these are some of like the roles that uh, like one youth youth organizer is doing in each youth group. So it's like beyond any kind of like five to nine job. Um, it's real community work. It's draining. It's exhausting. Um, you know, some cases like in some cases we're like on the clock all the time. Um, and the, these are like these. A lot of these people are also doing this as volunteers, not because we want, not because we're choosing to do it as volunteers, but it's because there's that lack of funding, um, and it's happening systemically. So I'll go to the next one. So just to give you an idea of like how systemic this problem is, we talked with these groups all across. Um, all, like all across Canada, all the way into the north, like into the Yukon and Northwest Territories, into the prairies, even into southern um, Ontario, and then even into the East Coast. And all these groups are very unique. Some are on reserve, some are on settlement, some are in cities, some are, um, some are, you know, it, some are like serving youth like all across a whole territory. Um, but the thing that they all have in common is that lack of funding and inability due to that systemic racism to do this work the way we need to. Um, some of the stories we heard from the youth organizers themselves is just like super heartbreaking and and it's just very frustrating that you know Canada keeps talking about reconciliation, but yet how are we how are we doing all this work and we're we're struggling to do it. All right, so common themes, as I mentioned, youth groups are doing a lot with very little. Uh, <laughs> when we were setting up earlier, Denise's dad was talking about that. <laughs> native, mm -hmm. native tricks, you know? <laughs> That's basically all the youth groups <laughs> doing, like, amazing work with, like, shoestring budgets. And, you know, the federal government's always talking about, we need to save money and da da da. It's like, go talk to like indigenous youth. <laughs> like, we know how to save money, like, it's no tomorrow. Um, but youth groups don't have access to infrastructure, spaces, buildings, um, equipment, supplies, land. Land is like the most important part of it all. But a lot of them don't have access to those. Um, and if there is access to them, we don't own them. So there's no consistency. It's it's like we have to ask someone else for permission to do our traditional our traditional activities. Uh, youth organizers are carrying the weight of caring for their communities. So again, like this burden is falling on the weight of a lot of the youth organizers we spoke to. The work of grassroots and community-based indigenous youth groups are being exploited. Um, so that's like a common theme that a lot of the youth groups experienced. So um, just to give you an example, like like A7G, we do a, a, a round dance every five years or every year. We've been doing it now for, we just did our sixth one, our sixth annual round dance. And uh, some of like the elders in Ottawa, because the round dance wasn't there for, for many years, they say like we brought the round dance back to Ottawa and the Algonquin area, or like we at least helped facilitate that. Um, and we do it like on a shoestring budget, but we do it like really big and we, we're really proud of it. Um, and then what happens is like, we'll see our work replicated without any conversation 
any support for our round dance. It's just like, well, we're going to do it over here um, and with a big budget and we're not going to support you. So things like that happen constantly. Our, our work, um, even if you like look at where TRC 66 right now, it's, it's stolen work. Um, it's work that I wasn't asked to be a part of um, and the work was stolen. So that, that's like a common, common theme for grassroots folks. There's not really a lot of protection for the work that we do. Um, and then uh, some other common themes are youth groups need to be autonomous. Um, so that was something that youth groups always mentioned is like that they're the experts of the work that they're doing. And so they, they, need, to, they need to be able to do it on their own terms. Um, and, and this is like a timeline that kind of articulates that as well. So you'll see in like 2014, um, some of us like me and Daryl and A7G and Nakota Youth Council starts mobilizing. And then as the years go on, you see more and more youth groups be beginning and starting because their needs aren't being met in the existing, um, existing services or programs that, that are out there. Um, so then some other ones are young people are defining youth initiatives and programming themselves. Um, and again, it kind of ties into autonomy. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really important one. And then funding that is designated for Indigenous youth is not getting to the youth. So some things that we're, uh, we're seeing is that um, like large corporations are applying for like reconciliation or youth funding and they're getting it over Indigenous youth groups. Um, it's kind of tying into that exploitation as well, because then those big corporations will come to us and be like, hey, do you guys wanna be part of this program? <laughs> and we're just like, no, like we're actually doing our own programming that we need support for. Um, and then lastly, space, and it kind of just articulates again, the lack of infrastructure. How am I doing for time? We're kind of on our own schedule now, but okay. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Ethical budget requirements. Um, so funding must be based on the best interest of the young people. It can't be based on the best interest of of an organization or of you know non-indigenous communities or corporations or things like that. A pretty obvious one, but in action we see it happen all the time that corporations and uh, you know how non-indigenous folks feel about reconciliation is often prioritized. Uh, funding must be funding must address substantive equi equality. Um, so it kind of speaks for itself. Um, we need we need substantial changes. Um, these like little like crumbs and like little little crumbs that were being offered just aren't going to be able to address the inequities that we experience. Um, youth groups define their own needs and budgets. So each youth group is really, really different. Some youth groups are like in need of like five staff, for example, or other youth groups just need one staff. And so we can't just put like a, a big mark on all of them and say this is what all youth groups should get. Uh, some of them are also have much more, um, much more cost needs because of like where they're located. So the further north you get, the more the more cost there. Are. Um, and then I'll go to the next ones. Um, yeah, reduce stipulations to access funding. Always like I feel like that's common about, amongst all indigenous organizations. Uh, living wages must be offered based on regions. Again, talking about the regional part. Um, and then must, so funding must support youth groups where they're at. Um, so a lot of funding we see right now, it kind of like pushes youth groups into something that, that has been predetermined outside of the youth group. So maybe a youth group doesn't really wanna be like a full organization and that's totally fine. Um, so really meeting them where they're at. And then the next ones. So the next ones are budget must include care and support for youth organizers. So all of the youth organizers we talk to don't have a full-time salary. They're making their salaries through grants here and there. 
So there's obviously no benefits or um, like retirement fund. Um, one of the youth group was talking about how we're constantly put in um, in ongoing poverty because if we're living like this from grant to grant, we're obviously not making enough money to be stable. We're not making enough money to get a mortgage or get a house and you know get out of that that poverty. And then lastly, equitable or ethical budget requirement is reporting must be defined by youth groups. So yeah. All right, immediate next steps um, that we determined are funding, fund existing community-based youth groups as a pilot at the bare minimum. Um, so again, like all these youth groups are already doing the work. Uh, so it's not like there needs to be some kind of um, like a steering committee that, that theorizes what youth groups could do. They're already doing the work, so fund them already. Um, establish a fund and a panel of experts on creating a permanent TRC 66 fund. Uh, so again, like at, even at a national level, there's no fund for youth. The funds for youth are kind of taken from here and taken from here here and there, but there's no actual actual fund for the youth. Um, establish a multi-year and core support funding mechanism supporting the TRC-66 fund. Um, and we need, we need like a, we need a separate body that will be able to hold them accountable. Um, you know, reconciliation, especially TRC 66 that has to deal with young people who are the descendants of the survivors. They have to be the ones who say if things are, are going smoothly or not. Um, it shouldn't be the government um, patting themselves on the back. <laughs> um, okay, next. I think that's it for our part of um, the summary. Hopefully, hopefully give you a lot of information and set the tone for the next couple of presentations you're going to hear. Um, yeah, how's, how's everybody feeling so far? <laughs> cool. So we're going to pass it over to Devin Salas. All the way from Willistaquay, <laughs> and Devin's going to talk a little bit about um, about how TRC sixty six is important to her and Willistaquay. Okay, <laughs> just give me a second. Yeah. Set up. I have all my notes because if I don't, I will go off the rails. All right. All right. Kwe Psitawan, Nitli was Nil Devon Salas, Naganajail Nagukuk. My name is Devon Salas, and I am a member of Nagukuk or Tobik First Nation. I am a Wulistikwe woman working for WNNBWTCI as the Youth and Language Coordinator. I'm a shared service as we do not currently have a dedicated budget for youth. I would like to give a special welcome to any Wulistikwe people who are watching, especially any of the youth. Um, I would like to acknowledge them and say, Gazalmo, I am here for you um, because of you. Um, uh, just uh, next slide. Um, we're not uh, we're not a very um, well known group outside of the East Coast, so I just thought I'd give a little uh, information about who we are. Uh, the Wolastoquig are the indigenous people of the Wolastoq watershed, currently known as the Saint John River and adjacent areas. Our traditional territory encompasses lands as well as marine fresh waters from the Bay of Fundy in the south of, of, uh, to the St. Lawrence River in the north. This large territory includes parts of Canadian provinces of New Brunswick and Quebec, as well as northeastern Maine in the United States. Willistic Week are also sometimes known as Maliseet, a name given to us by our Mi'kmaq neighbors. Next slide, when you have. Oh, sorry, one, one second. Sorry. We're doing a little bit of a shuffle. Can I sit? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. do it. That's, yeah. that's super careful. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Feel free to prop the door open as well if, if you know. Yeah. Yeah. It is getting a little stuffy. Yeah. <laughs> Best <laughs> way. Gabby, do you want to do the slides? Sorry, guys. No worries. No worries. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm going to continue. The next slide, please. Okay, perfect. No, wait, next slide. Um, so, Willowstick Bay Nation in New Brunswick, WNNB, works collaboratively with our communities to assert Indigenous and treaty rights. Our WNMBW TCI Youth Committee was formed in early 2022 with two youth from each of our six communities, initially just with WNMB, to guide uh, consultation efforts with Willowstickway youth in our New Brunswick communities. Next slide, please. There are currently youth groups in some, but not all, of our Willowstickway communities in New Brunswick. The youth in the committee have expressed that much of the time when youth-oriented programming has been implemented, it is either a one-time event or there is a lack of consistency. This is not due to the lack of care or understanding of importance of our youth. The funding is just not there to be consistent. Being a first contact nation, the effects of colonialism have eliminated some aspects of our traditional way of Wolostoque life and endangered our Wolostoque language. Next slide, please. At the end of January, we held our first event, Zagomo Zuwagen, sorry, the strong feeling of well being. It was a two day event for. So we are ensured to incorporate both from both worlds. Uh, we collected feedback on what they believe would be helpful to get youth engaged in WNMB files regarding land and water rights while being sensitive to their mental and physical well-being. Uh, the photo you see here um, is a wall of notes from the youth who attended um, uh, our event in January to the other youth who were not present or who might need words of support. And it was a really beautiful way for us to end our events. Uh, the youth took photos and they posted them to their social media and then we posted it to our social media so the youth could see. Uh, next slide. Uh, after many meetings with our youth and what they would be interested in having workshops on through grant funding, we are able to put together uh, workshops for the youth in spring of uh, 2023 through to the fall. Um, and these are some of the ones we have here that we are planning on. Um, there's uh, the fiddlehead ash basket making and fiddleheading. Uh, fiddleheading is an important food source um, and a symbol in our nation. Uh, we will be having this event on the last Saturday of the month with uh, 10 youth present for the basket making and approximately 20 will be uh, coming to do some fiddleheading with us. Um, we are focusing on start to finish events for our youth so that they can do these activities again and then they can engage with other youth who are interested in these activities. Um, these will not be workshops where they come and are not engaged or aware of the process of how, uh, for instance, the ash baskets are made. Um, they will be able to know how to identify the trees how to use, and how to use the ash. Um, I've currently got people who are out right now who are pounding the ash for our basket making. Um, I will also be making print and video resources available from these workshops for our youth who are not present due to funding limitations. Uh, these resources are sorely needed and asked for by the youth communities to better understand and engage uh, with traditional practices and processes. Unfortunately, though, I have not been able to confirm all of these events yet because of the limitations that come with micro.
it's a once in a blue moon event. Um, as much as I have been clear with our youth that participate in our events, that I am here for them and that I work for them, I understand that without the consistency, it is really difficult for me and for all of us to build trust with youth in our communities. Um, and uh, that it looks like we can't follow through on our word. Um, in our event in January, one of the feedback items that I received that really stuck with me from a youth in our community was that their mental health was at an all time low and they were just really excited to be a part of anything with us. And um, that they were ex happy to just be exposed to other youth in our communities because um, even though our communities are not super far apart from each other, a lot of the youth just never interact with each other and they don't know who each other are. So um, they're very happy to be a part of these things together, not just in their own communities. Um, so this is proof that our work is life-saving work that we do in our communities and that consistency <coughs> is imperative for not only their trust, but also for their well-being. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in this slide, you see a list of uh, event, uh, a list of what the youth have presented to me as priorities for them, and it's very long, as you can see. Um, but two that stuck out are mental health and traditional activities with the elders. Um, they are really, really hungry to learn. And uh, through my discussions with our youth committee and through feedback from our event, the youth have a strong desire to strengthen their Wallistoque identities, understand who we are, why we did the things we did, and how we did the things we did, and where they belong in our communities. It is my belief that if our youth were given the tools that they need to foster their Wallistoque identities, they could be active participate, participants in our consultation processes, along with their desire to understand how and why they can uh, exercise their rights in Wallistoque. I have put in for funding for a program that would bring our youth and our elders together as this current generation of elders is the last who have really strong memories of what it was like to have that natural transfer of knowledge between elder and youth. Um, unfortunately, uh, the process of applying for these kinds of fundings is not guaranteed for success and our youth are left to wait for months to see if we are actually successful or if we need to apply again next year. Um, we are asked to pour our souls into these applications to people and organizations that we don't know and wait for months for a decision. And if we are unsuccessful, these programs just do not happen. Uh, I currently do not work out of a dedicated youth budget beyond the one grant that I have received. And I work with other department budgets to be able to get programming or work done because we understand how important this is for our youth and for us as a nation. Um, and I would really like to express that this, it is not the fault of Indigenous peoples in Canada that our culture and traditions have turned into workshops and one-off events that we can hold when we're able to, that our youth do not have access to language and culture, that our parents, elders, and ancestors were denied, and that we have an inherent right to. Our youth know exactly what they need to revitalize their Wallistoque identities, and it is the fiscal responsibility of Canada to follow through on its commitments and promises to our young people. Next slide, please. So I would just like to thank uh, Gabby and A7G for having us be a part of this important work. It means a lot to me. Our youth mean a lot to me. Um, I was working for our youth before they knew me and um, now they're all starting to get to know me. And I'm very clear with them that I work for them. Um, and I'll end this off with, uh, with some words from one of our amazing elders, Elder Ed Purley. Um, at our event, he started and ended each day with our youth saying to them, um, so I'm gonna say to any youth who are witnessing this event, who need to hear it, if no one told you today that they love you, know that I love you. Um, so, Jiwali Wan, and thank you so much for everyone for listening. Okay, so I was told that, that, will this uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, like, turkey feathers as really sacred, mm -hmm. so I, I got this big turkey oh, feather okay. for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
So, so now we're gonna transition to online. Oh, just go in the next tab. Hello, can folks hear me? I'm ready. Perfect. Um, hello, um, my name is Alyssa Carpenter. I'm the project director of the Western Arctic Youth Collective. I am really grateful to join virtually um, to support um, the young team that is there on the ground. Um, I applaud them all and all the efforts they do to get here because it's been a really long, heavy, exhausting journey um, as they quickly kind of just went through. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, who the Western Arctic Youth Collective is. So if you can see your screen, um, the Western Arctic Youth Collective is a youth for youth by youth initiative that comes from the Western Arctic Youth region of the Northwest Territories and most recently bringing in the Yukon in Canada. Um, we try to create opportunities and to support and prepare the ongoing development of young people that is needed. Um, specifically, we really focus on 18 to 35 because we find that was the biggest gap that was shared as Indigenous young people in our region when the idea of wake was there. And like shared in the beginning, um, wake is existing because of, we were seeing gaps, we were seeing challenges, or and we were also being disappointed of seeing who was receiving resources and who was funding what. And it's pretty heartbreaking that is still a common trend. Um, there are many capable Indigenous young people in these regions that deserve the opportunity to learn uh, and give back and feel supported. And we are a region as well. It's been a really hard couple of years. Um, we've had incredible rates of losses to suicide and overdose, especially those under the ages of 30 and especially our Indigenous young men. So that was something that we were talking about when we came together, when we held something. Um, we are not our own organization. We don't have the core resources as many as expressed to operate that way. Um, we are a project of Make Wish Charitable Society. Uh, we have some really strong relationships within the Northern Outreach team that gave us some flexible resources to host some events back in 2019. And they invited us to join their platform in 2020. Even being on this platform and the support they provide, we still need those core resources to operate and to meet the demand and need of what's been expressed for us. Um, we got some attention when we won what's called the Arctic Inspiration Prize. It's a, a pretty um, well-known prize in the Arctic communities and regions. Um, we got some attention there, but we also highlighted that is not enough to keep us going. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, uh, how we envision is collaborative based, it's community based, it's what we talk about fending e equity and we're doing a lot of education even in our northern regions because we were finding that some local organizations um, are having a really hard time operating in this way as well. So we're trying to be like, we're trying to learn from what they're doing. And it's been a really heartbreaking challenge because we still get denied significantly in doing the things that we're doing. And we're responsive based and we really bring in capacity building to foster mentorship because we want Indigenous young people to gain these skills, to gain and be supported in the way they deserve and to also access future opportunities. And sometimes that takes a lot of support on our team. Our team does a lot of in-kind work behind the scenes, especially myself. Um, that list that Gabby put up prior of all those things, that's me. Um, and I'm a mom. So it's a lot of heavy lifting to keep this going. And even with some supports in place, we're very fortunate for it's not enough. 
Rake's story as shared started in 2018. It was an idea. It was meeting the need because we were not being supported in the ways that we needed. And we posed the question to other organizers and community members how much we needed that support. Um, so we participated in a program and from there it just escalated. Um, one small gathering that we kind of were like, we're gonna do this every year um, has evolved into multiple events and gatherings. And it's pretty incredible when you look at the pictures. Um, yeah, right there, perfect. Um, when you look at the pictures and a bit of our storyline, um, it's we've done a lot for a small team that works on project-based resources. So, and we have a lot of videos to capture and photos that we've done by supporting Indigenous young people as well and mastering their skills so that they can go on to future opportunities as well. Next slide. Um, a lot of work. We were one of the busiest northern groups to be doing work during the pandemic. And the reason being is because mental health challenges and lack of programming and um, people would be like, what about online support? Well, the north doesn't have great internet connections. So it was really paramount for us to keep offering things and working with the restrictions and guidelines that were pressured on us because these exchanges, these cultural exchanges, these knowledge sharing, these gatherings, especially for grief and loss and support and validating these young people and their stories and experiences is really needed. It's saving lives. And then look at our next page, look at 2013, what we've done with project-based resources. Um, we've done probably what other organizations have done in a year up in the three months because we were pressured to use funding that we had that took so long to be decided to be given to us, yet arrive in our resource bank to use to go to project funds. Um, I A third of our funding from this year arrived in March and April to be used for that previous fiscal year. That's not okay. And that's been a common trend since we've existed. And I'm sure I'm not the only group to go through that if you are successful on some funding, but it's a lot of waiting. It's a lot of decision-making. And sometimes when they tell you no, it's really unfair and not clear on why, um, when we deserve what we're doing and we're meeting the need in that way. And you need community expertise involved. Um, you need people from those regions and communities actively involved. Um, that's not the common thing of when you come to look at Northern regions, and I'm speaking specifically on the region we're in, um, it's we can't have folks who don't know our regions to come to programming. That's not that might help some, but it's not going to make the bigger impact that is needed. But when you look at our team, we've done a lot of creative ways and awareness. We've done a lot of supporting youth who may not be able to be present in those spaces, but want to contribute through art and graphic um, and just bringing awareness to a lot of the issues that they see. You can see we've done a lot with partnering with youth who put a lot out there because they care about youth and wanted them to access that. So access to imagery around culture, stay alive messages from groups like Ulakut. Um, it's lots of work that we're doing and being creative with because we want to see them supported for their efforts as well. And that's a lot of unpaid work that we do because we see it and we value it and it helps us. Next slide, please. <laughs> And then again, there's some international ones. There's some folks who've been so active on social media to bring awareness. So we support them for what they already do um, and already put out there and utilize in a way. So it's really important to see that reciprocity and that's how we value the relationships we have too. Um, last slides, please. Um, this is probably something that hits home for I think a lot of the folks who are there present bringing awareness to this. Um, our team's wellness is super critical in this because it impacts so many people. And it's something we highlight because we see it in a lot of ways. But we accept this responsibility. We care about the people's lives that we're interacting with. But we're very exhausted. It's a lot of burnout and compassion fatigue. There's a lot of vicarious trauma because a lot of us are hearing hard truths and stories and experiences that have happened to other people where they've been wronged. Um, or judged or discriminated against. There's a lot that we help unpack, but we carry that when we go on to programming. So take, be, having resources to take care of ourselves and the load that we carry. There's still a lot of doubt and criticism, a lot of lateral violence we witness and experience. 
And then hammering home to the next slide is we need the equitable funding to exist for us. We, this is something as uh, um, before I even got introduced to these young people in these groups and to A7G and following what they did with the roadmap process. Um, that, that call to action has not been fulfilled. <laughs> um, it's really disappointing to see it, even again, as they announce federal budgets and commitments, this is still lacking significantly and there's multiple groups that can attest to this. Um, but we need, if you are an organizer, you need grassroots community organizing resources and we need that connection to other groups for that support and solidarity as well. But we need the, the collaborative partnerships who value us and see us and validate us. And the biggest thing is we need to honor and respect Indigenous youth and their lived experiences, what they're sharing and putting themselves out there. It's very hard, exhausting work that um, it's hard to see some light sometimes. And trusting that we know how to organize these safe spaces because we've built this trust and connections. And again, I'm only speaking from my region and from interacting and learning about the efforts that they're doing but it's so important that it's seen that way um, and that it's a model moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of work that these Indigenous young people deserve for what they're doing in their home communities. There's a lot of languages that are being lost, cultures being, our cultures being impacted. Our way of life and quality life is, def, uh, is, is insanely being um, impacted. Um, and the why I'm doing what I'm doing is I mentioned I'm a mother, I have a three-year-old I want her to not go through the experiences that I went through. That's why I'm getting involved from this way. Um, other avenues were not helping me in the way that I needed to. And I think that resonates for a lot of people. Um, so I really hope this is taken as seriously as they are of showing up and the solidarity and groups having to do this themselves of coming together. And I, yeah, I think I, as someone who's very exhausted right now and at the one of the worst times as it is in nonprofit kind of sectors to operate, um, we need more support um, because my quality of life is being impacted and it impacts our team and other people. And these are people's jobs. They need, they need the support and they need to be able to take care of themselves doing it because they're doing the heavy lifting that has originated from what contact has done in our regions. Um, and the ongoing implications of what colonization through policy, procedure, grants, the way it's structured, it's a messy process. So really listen to what they're saying and validate and support and show up for them. Musi Cho, Cleonaini, um, and really proud of all you there um, in the big city. Wish I was there and not here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Gabby Daniels. Um, I am And we are representing Young Indigenous Women's Utopia. Uh, we are based out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan on TV6 territory, traditional homeland of the Métis. Um, just to take a quick introduction ourselves. Um, I'm from Mr. Wasis Mihailoff, which is um, an hour north of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and also the Moapa Band of Paiutes, uh, north of Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm from Kakawish Tau Treaty 4 territory, and Little Pine, I don't know what treaty that is, but... And she's also a Kakawish Tau senior um, yeah, princess. Yeah, I'm senior princess for my reserve. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Yabu was formed in 2017 by Jen Altenberg and Carrie Watney. Um, in the inner city of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, um, so the west side, 
on the hood. Um, our first meeting was located at 20th Street West, which is uh, right in the roof. Um, and we ho they hosted a workshop. And at the time, we didn't know what it was what, like what it was about. It was just they asked us what we knew what gender based violence was, what we were facing at school, and just in the inner city um, in general. Um, and at the time, a lot of us were like really shy. Most of the girls knew each other. I didn't know anyone in the group. Um, so we did a lot of post-it notes and a lot of journal entries. Um, so as the groups progressed, we did a lot of journal writing. Uh, we did ribbon skirt classes. Uh, we went to ceremony uh, quite a few times. Did we do medicine picking? Yeah, medicine picking a lot. Um, Respect writing. Horseback riding. Uh, we did a lot of trips to uh, such as Victoria, BC, Indiana, wherever Indiana is, uh, Toronto, and Montreal. Um, and through the journal entries and uh, post it notes, uh, we wrote a book. Uh, we published a book on self love. Um, and it doesn't have a name, it's just Young Indigenous Women's Utopia. We don't have any copies right now, uh, but if you want to buy a copy, we'll give you the link. <laughs> um, so we started this group when we were about... I was 12. I'm and 19. I was 13 and I'm 19 now, so it's been a few years. Um, so once, about, about two years ago, uh, since the older girls had, you know, got all the teachings and everything, we decided that it was time to form a second group, uh, Utopia 2.0. And most of the girls are our cousins, sisters, um, or just kids from school. Um, and with those girls, we also did more journal entries because uh, the thing with like youth is they're shy. And I've noticed that I was that youth, Kaylin was that youth. Um, so again, with the girls, we did um, journal entries. That's them at the book launch. Yeah, that's my sister and that's Kaylin's sister. <laughs> Um, so we did a lot of journal entries with them, and then those girls published a book. Uh, Kiana Osepic. Um, and this book is just a lot of art pieces, journal entries, poems. Just um, a way of them expressing themselves yeah. and what happens to them in the inner city. Um, with the girls as well, we did gender-based violence teachings. Uh, MMIW, medicine pickings, and something with the girls that we did this time was harm reduction training. Um, in the inner city, there is a lot of um, drugs and alcohol. Um, so just giving them teachings with harm reduction can help save a life and save someone in their family or even their own lives. Um, so with the labor of love and TRC 66, um, since our funding, has gone out um we haven't been able to meet as much as we want to um with the first utopia we met like monthly every month we'd meet um we are funded through more than words and networks for change through mcgill and york university um and they were funded through sshrc funding so that meant we were able to meet monthly whenever we wanted um rent out whatever space we wanted um food compensation for the girls so honorariums um and due to the lack of funding we rarely meet i would say we meet every couple months yeah um and we're meeting currently out of oskaya high school which is um the high school that jen works at so we're not meeting as much as we want to um and something that jen and carrie always thought was right was to give honorariums to us just because of the knowledge we're sharing the stories of our own that we're sharing. Um, so yeah, we're not meeting as much as we want to. Um, and there's no full-time funding to offer full-time salaries to have, uh, you know, an elder work with us or a knowledge keeper um, or cultural uh, experts. So currently at the moment, Young Indigenous Women's Utopia is funded through community fundraising and donations, so write in letters to different corps um, within Saskatoon, different universities. 
Uh, yeah, next slide. So with the Young Indigenous Women's Utopia, um, in order for us to currently, you know, uh, like go back to the beginning stage, so like meet in regularly honorariums, I can't make this. Two full-time staff, uh, one project manager and one scholar slash writer slash artist in residence. Um, an administration space. Um, we can special events to cover our space. So wherever we decide to meet up, our food, because we do feed the girls while we're there, snacks, supplies, you know, journals, pencils, um, even computers, um, honorariums, like I said before, um, and travel funds. Um, recently with the trips that we have been taking, We've had to write like uh, letters for grants. We've had to fundraise on our own, write to our reserves. Um, Honorarios participants, I keep saying that one. Um, and then funds for activities. So uh, we did murals. Painting a mural isn't cheap. Uh, paint's really expensive. So the cost of paint, brushes, um, gas to go medicine picking outside of the city because you're not going to find sage in the city somewhere. Um, ribbon skirts, fabric, uh, ribbons, glue, sewing machines, you know. Um, <laughs> um, drumming, the full moon ceremonies that we do. Where's the last one? Sir? Oh, et cetera. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, this is something that the labor of love and um, would help us accomplish um, because yeah, at the moment we're not meeting up. Um, we see each other every couple months. And yeah, I feel like I think that's the last one. Do I have another slide? No. Um, <laughs> um yeah but that's the presentation it's very short <laughs> sorry that our uh slideshow was so bland i feel <laughs> cheap compared to everyone else um grassroots. yeah <laughs> it's very My uncle's name translates to a girl standing in the middle of a field. Um, my English name is Denise Miller from Six Nations, um, Ontario, Canada. I'm Cuga Nation, Wolf Clan. Um, this is Yang Hongo, um, Maisie. <laughs> uh, I created revitalizing our sustenance project in May 2020 um, and I'll just talk a little bit uh, briefly about what we do in our origin story and then why TRC 66 is important to us or why um, it should happen right <laughs> um, our origin story began May 2020 it was like the first summer of COVID-19 so uh, me and my family, we, re we realized like the grocery costs were becoming a lot um, more expensive. And on the reserve, um, there was a lack of like on reserve um, food security. So we couldn't really purchase any groceries or fresh produce organically and stuff like that, or even Hanashoni um, seeds for food um, varieties. Um, and there's also a lack of Haudenosaunee 
awareness surrounding our food systems, both like modern farming systems and even just like in Canada, there's um, a lot of conversations surrounding food sovereignty and like freedom um, for farmers to have like their own organic produce and taxes and stuff like that. But then our indigenous farmers and our food systems are never on the conversation or we're not really seen, I guess, like important. And the advocacy, the work that they do, um, like Can Canadian farmers, they don't all consider us either on those policies when they're making um, changes and stuff like that. Um, it's really hard to see. Um, and there's also a lack of education surrounding our health and nutrition because a lot of our Haudenosaunee food systems, they are very supportive with postnatal health and toddler health. And even just when you're pregnant, there's not a lot of like awareness surrounding um, what we used to eat when we were pregnant or when the baby was small and stuff like that. So um, that's another reason why um, this project is really important because um, we need to get back to our food systems and also to like help with um, our prenatal postnatal experiences because they're changing a lot right now and even just with connecting to your womb and your baby um, it's like a really spiritual journey and, it, and our food isn't really um, I guess like there's no resources to really know what to do when you're pregnant or how to raise a baby, what they need to eat and stuff like that. So that's kind of like what I'm trying to focus on more in the future. Yes. <laughs> and she likes to eat too. <laughs> um, so this is some of the projects that we're doing. Right now we're starting a Revitalize This podcast. It's just discussion surrounding Haudenosaunee food systems, knowledge, indigenous knowledge, food awareness, farmer realities, especially when you're um, an indigenous farmer, like what we go through on or off reserve, uh, sport nutrition, how our food systems help athletes or what we should do to become better athletes, and the hard conversations surround, surrounding our food systems because we have a lot of barriers, especially with this, um, when we're talking about um, TRC 66, like as young people and as young farmers, especially on reserve, we have no access to funding, absolutely no access to funding. So I think having these conversations are really important because what are we going to do in the future, right? Like how are we supposed to keep our programs going when we don't have no funding opportunities to kind of expand especially if we have 26 acres to deal with right where um we have to um work on the landscape and i hate to say it but trees cost a lot of money and native species cost a lot of money <laughs> okay okay <laughs> and um one other project that we're also focusing on is soil remediation so we're trying to rebuild our soil our nutrient levels are a bit are low and we're also researching ways and we're researching different ways to um, improve like soil contaminations through holistic practices that enrich um, and <laughs> that enrich and support natural environments um, because climate change is very real and I think as indigenous people especially I guess like on reserve when we're talking about food sovereignty we really need to understand and research ways like to deal with contaminants because it's happening in all our communities and we need to learn more about how we can um, help our environment and our natural species na uh, native species sorry um, and one other project that we're working on this summer, uh, we're building a mini longhouse. So um, we're gonna start kind of like creating a landscape that 
people can see like how our Haudenosaunee villages look like or like how we um, planted and stuff like that. Um, but that's like, I guess for looking at ways to educate our communities um, because there's no funding that supports large-scale farming or even just like um, building the um, buildings that we need in order to um, produce food for our community and that's like a really hard uh, obstacle that I'm facing and our fa my family's facing right now is that um, a lot of the grant outlines and funding that you need to access to get farming equipment or even just to build buildings on you need to be incorporated and you need to have um, charitable status and you need to have um, band council recognition or like approval and when you're when you're sovereign and you're trying to establish um, a food a food sovereignty initiative we don't go through band council, especially if you're Haudenosaunee, like uh, we go through our confederacy and our traditional government and the big farming granting opportunities, they don't recognize that. And they also don't consider um, policies that are supposed to support indigenous communities, but they don't really like create policies that help us especially when we're talking about youth. And this is a great way, um, labor of love report is a great way that we can um, show people <laughs> like the barriers that we're facing, especially with um, when we're talking about food. Um, I think that's about it for me. Sorry, my baby is like going cray cray. <laughs> Uh, good day, my relatives, uh, friends, allies. Uh, introduce myself in my traditional Iarhe Nakoda, uh, which means the mountain Nakoda, the mountain people from Orly, Alberta, and Treaty 7. Um, the Tonko Wagichi, which means dancing buffalo. I was also given the name Wachha Toganaka I Tansha uh, by my adopted family in Rosebud, or Sinchangu Lakota, which means the one that leads with his heart. My English name is Daryl Kootenay, and I said it's a beautiful day here in New York, and uh, stand in front of you all with a good heart. And uh, I'm here um, representing the Nakota Youth Council, and that's our, our logo up there. Um, and really, you know, um, being asked to speak and, and share on behalf of the Nakota Youth Council is a—it's an honor, it's a privilege, and uh, you know, I think the history, as Gabby showed in the timeline, about uh, you know 2014—that's almost I was thinking about it, it's almost almost 10 years ago—and uh, thinking about our history and how you know where we are today, and especially in New York and, and, the, and the Big Apple at the United Nations of all places. That same year was the year I, I attended the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples here in New York. And, um, you know, when I felt the, the, the power and the strength of people in that General Assembly Hall like this morning, um, seeing the pride and integrity and the strength where everyone's defending their people and their communities, um, that really inspired me to go home and, and focus on my community and, and youth primarily and, 
and at the point there was a big uh, suicide and overdose mm. overdose pandemic that was happening um so i decided to um co-found the nakota youth council myself and two others and in the beginning our chief uh, council our leadership were on board and, and supported us and actually funded us through this youth engagement strategy program that they had and uh really kind of helped us set a foundation to do youth programming. And one of the big things that we did was uh, have uh, what we called youth nights, um, where we had our youth center that was given to us um, to utilize once a week. And we had, um, you know, this gym and a kitchen, and that's all we needed to, to bring youth to come do, you know, volleyball is big in our community, floor <laughs> hockey and in the kitchen, we'd always kind of um, create meals and such. And it was a really good atmosphere for youth to go to after school. And it was uh, uh, very well attended. Um, and as a few years went on, um, we started to, uh, um, you know, we, we, our funding got cut and our funding wasn't renewed. And from that point on, there was uh, seven of us. And, and a lot of the original youth that were there are still helping out today and are, are playing a big role in the Dakota Youth Council. And from that point on, we, we didn't take, you know, um, and then the story, the way we tell it and the way we looked at it as young people at the time was that when our funding doesn't get renewed like that, um, it means that our chief and council are telling us that we're not worth investing in, that our, our efforts are not important. Um, so we've decided to continue on the work, even though, um, you know, we, some of us, most of us weren't even getting paid for that work as well. Um, we were hosting and, and uh, there was a position that was shared uh, with the coordinator. And uh, about a year or so after that, um, eventually we were able to um, secure funding. And that led us to coming here in New York as a group, as a delegation that was youth led, youth organized, youth um, fundraised and youth developed uh, from a basement and it reminds me kind of a place like this, and uh, and we and that opportunity I think changed a lot of our community's perspective, and our community um, in many ways celebrated us when we went back home, and. Uh, When you come to a place like this, when we're talking about your rights as a community, as a person, as someone who, who has connection to land or, or to arts or, you know, to our places in, in urban uh, societies, but also out on the land, uh, makes you think about how much you need to protect and how much you need to preserve. So a lot of our uh, programming was really local community focused. And, and uh, from that point on, a lot of our funding was really hit or miss. And we'd be doing lots with a little bit of funding that we got, or we'd be doing nothing at all because we didn't have any funding. And so our kind of reputation is kind of like that. It's a constant roller coaster. We're doing things and then we're not doing things for a little period of time. We're doing things and then we're not. And for ourselves, it really became a, um, you know, you can see the benefits and when young people come together uh, to help other young people, it's it's probably to me one of the most inspiring things to see. And as a young person, you know, I'm I'm getting a lot older now, you know, because ten years ago I was just thinking uh, ten years already. Um, a lot of the youth today who are stepping into our shoes, um, you know, when you see them helping other youth, you know, just like the ones that just presented before me, um, you know, that's why we do this kind of work. And for the Nakoda Youth Council, we started to. Um, you know, really build right relations, and that's really like partnering and finding organizations that you know do have funding that we can utilize, and that's kind of how we we get here now at the UN um, is we find other organizations to help, uh, uh, and we advocate for our youth to come and participate. So we have two youth that have never been here before that are participating in this year's permanent forum. But as we continue this work. Um, you know, uh, I think about when that suicide and opioid um, or that drug um, uh, uh, rate was very high um, it only got worse 
um, since then, and our community has really gone into, you know, the red zone of, of high suicide rates um, and high overdoses. And right now, the the programs that we currently have um, that are are funded in some capacity um, is we started uh, uh, two years ago a traditional bow and arrow making uh, program where we invited an elder to uh, take our youth out onto the land. And with, just with a knife, you can create a bow and an arrow. And we called that program Ija Dipe, Dipe, which means a bow and arrow in our language. And to be able to um, um, do that with just a knife, you know, that empowering and that traditional knowledge um, and being able to learn about how important that is, um, you know, is really uh, what we uh, strive for. And after that happened, we realized that there was a lot of interest in that program. And uh, we ended up trying to search for more funding and, and got some funding last year um, to do, uh, to broaden that program. And so now, so now we, we actually have a, an archery program where we, able, we were able to, to buy real bows and arrows and uh, recurve and compound bows. And our goal now is, is to continue the traditional um, uh, uh, bow making, but teach the ethics of what it really means to be a, a, a hunter or a protector in your community. And for myself, living in the Rocky Mountains, you know, I love big game hunting. And uh, the skill of some of our warriors back in the day prior to contact about how close you get to animals enough to touch them while they're sleeping. You know, I wish we could do that today, but now we got these big, bigger rifles and such that literally can just shoot from a vehicle, which unfortunately a lot of our, our people do today. We're getting lazy is what it is. And I think our young people, you know, when we do programs with the youth that you hear tonight that are reconnecting us and actually doing the hard work that our ancestors used to do, it's really empowering. And to me, it's really has a lot to do with connecting to the land and understanding that that um, our youth are, are hungry for that and have the passion, as like Gabby said, are really doing the work and all we got to do is fund them. And for myself, over the last decade, I've really kind of uh, seeing the Nakota Youth Council grow is that, uh, you know, we really are still not funded. Um, you know, I, I often advocate for, for salaries uh, in programs now that I wish I knew a long time ago. Um, and so those salaries sometimes work, sometimes doesn't. And so right now, I think, you know, um, this past year was a really good year for us because we, we were able to do and partner with so many people and we got a small, smaller grant of about 20,000. And we were able to turn that into 100,000 um, because of all the partners that we had. And we got told a lot that, you know, the work we're doing is worth millions of dollars and they could see it plain and simple that um, the efforts you guys are doing is, is easily, you know, worth that amount of money and that you guys should be, you know, you're organized, you're, you're running things and doing things as a, as a uh, um, three-figure organization. And so for me, um, you know, the positions to, to, to give to young people is probably my, my biggest goal right now is to try and find funds to pay young people to keep doing the work. And it's really hard. I mean, I myself learned how to how to be a consultant and such, and that's also what I want to teach young people to do more of too. But also, if we were to get funding, um, hundred thousand, you know, uh, multi, you know, million dollar contract, I think we could honestly change the world with all the people that have contributed to this document, to this report, and those that are not able to be here and that do carry a lot of that knowledge. The last thing I will say is, um, you know. And being a part of this this uh, um, report, you know, I really appreciate how Gabby and and the and the crew, um, you know, really dug into and took the time to to gather information at that grassroots level. Because the Nakota Youth Council has been doing some pretty amazing work, but you know, we don't know people, and people don't know us that are at high levels, and therefore, we don't really care about that because we prioritize community and family and the language. And that's where our heart is. And so therefore, we haven't really gone out of our, our umbrella. But yet, you know, here we are in the, the UN and, and such, and, and we do kind of keep tabs and, and connect with other Indigenous youth that are at those levels. And to us, that's a lot more worth, um, um, uh, that are worth a lot more than knowing, you know, um, people that carry 
that kind of funding. And I think to me, you know, each organization's results and how they fix their community is going to be different. And therefore, that's why it's important that each each organization gets, you know, their own pool of funding, because we are all indigenous peoples that come from the land and the land determines who we are and where we come from. And as we all know, Ina Makocha, Mother Earth, is different in each province and in each in each direction. And therefore, the solutions for sustainable um, change is going to be different. And it really is the grassroots that know how to make that change and can identify it. And so to me, that's what we call a wise practice, knowing that knowledge really deeply that's really in the roots. And the youth are those uh, wise practices that bring that out through the strength and the gifts that are already there. You just got to give the funding and the money and you'll see it change really quickly and fast. And to me, that seems so simple, but, uh, you know, it, it also probably the biggest hurdle the cross for some reason and that's just the way the wasichu we say um, the non-indigenous world works and so to me a big thanks and a big uh, respect for you know the organizations that have been involved but I know there's a ton out there for those that are you know on YouTube um, that are watching you know um, you guys know that uh, uh, we're here and we want to work with you we want to help you and the more we bring our voices together, the more bigger change we can make. And um, yeah, reach out and let's work together. Oh, Nish, and thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I just have one uh, little statement to read from one of our youth groups that couldn't be here. So I'm just going to find that in my email because I, I don't know where my phone is. <laughs> but I'm just going to do that really quickly and then uh, it shouldn't take me very long. Nice. I already found it. Okay. <laughs> this is my email. Look at my 5,000 emails. <laughs> if that doesn't tell you <laughs> what's happening with youth groups, <laughs> we haven't expressed enough how overworked we are. There you go. Um, I just want to okay. So um, one of the youth groups is from Toronto. And uh, Toronto actually has a huge population of Indigenous peoples in the city of Toronto, uh, which is kind of like, I think, shocking to some people because we usually think of like the prairies or in the north as like the highest populations, but Toronto has a huge population of urban indigenous folks. Uh, so Anna, who's their leader of uh, the indigenous support project over there, um, said this. So the indigenous support project started off providing relief materials and cultural education to indigenous communities within Canada, which quickly expanded to across the globe. Founded in 2020 at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, TIS helped Indigenous peoples and youth in Toronto area through food security, uh, cultural education, peer-to-peer -peer support, community outreach, and access to land. Current programming provides, a cult provides cultural events, activities, and resources that would otherwise not be available to community members. TIS supports community members through traditional methods of education, through a, a land and community-based lens. The work TISP has carried out for the last three years has been emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically exhausting and taxing on many members. A main concern is having a safe, private, accessible space for youth to attend programming and receive additional supports if needed. TISP, TISP team are currently operating a full, at full capacity with half the required amount of funding to meet the needs of the community. The funding we currently have does not include the cost of renting or owning a space or a company vehicle for programs and food and meal drop-offs. TISP's largest expense is renting spaces for youth programming. The second largest expense for us is securing full-time positions for staff, which, are, which we are currently not able to provide. The labor and care intensive work that has been put in by TISP and the community are at risk due to vulnerabilities surround, surrounding the uncertainty of safe programming and, and program space. 
The community and the staff members have no indication of secured programming in a timely manner. Having sustained funding will help address these issues as well as provide a much needed opportunity for TIS team to rebuild their emotional capacity and capabilities to continue out this work for the next seven generations to come. Miigwech. Cool, so thanks everyone for coming out. Um, we're not gonna move up. But um, yeah, that's that's uh, just a few of the youth groups. We're missing, um, we're missing a few that uh, again are just like over capacity, um, so they couldn't be with us. But um, yeah, what we're really here doing at the UN is we want to put pressure on the federal government to fund these at least these ten youth groups as a starting point. Um, and we're currently working on a statement. Um, so if folks know how to get a statement on the floor at the UN, let us know, because <laughs> we'd love to get it on the floor. Um, we would really like to, with the statement, we would really like to um, put pressure on creating an Indigenous youth accountability mechanism for the Canadian government um, so that the Canadian government cannot continue to just say nice words and offer symbolic gestures, but that Indigenous youth can be in charge of what goes forward and what accountability looks like and what reconciliation looks like. So if you want to support us, let us know. <laughs> yeah, that, that concludes our night. Thank you. Thanks so much to yeah. Relative Art NYC. Can we do some shopping? Oh my gosh, yes, you can absolutely do some